Jeffrey, welcome. Oh, thank you, Kapil. Great to be here. And, and thank, thank you, you and, and, and Minit for the overly generous words of introduction at the start. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be part of this. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Genuinely, we're honored. Your experience is going to be vital for the industry, which has just begun, just begun to make some strategic changes in, in, in its influence and the industry structure. So we welcome you. Thank you very much for joining. My first question would be to you is that given your extensive experience across the critical areas of policymaking. I, I like to start in conversations like this by going back to first principles. Um, and forgive me if it seems overly, simp overly simplistic, but the, the first question I'd ask is what is the purpose of aviation policy, of any country's aviation policy? I think we all know that it is to grow the economy, to provide mobility to citizens, to uh, provide business with the access it needs to supplies and to meetings and so forth, to bring tourism in, um, really to enhance the, the overall wherewithal of a country to continue to grow and succeed. It, it, it genuinely contributes to prosperity, both domestic and international. But of course, that's not the only purpose of aviation policy. Aviation policy has to also be directed at the quality of the aviation sector itself right? You want to have healthy airlines. And that's that's a struggle that uh, the United States has gone through and India, India has gone through. We, we've tried to open our, open our doors to maximum competition. And we discovered that um, uh, competition can come with a price. Uh, the price can be less stable airlines than you would want, a less stable industry, uh, too many crises within the business and uh, investors begin to go away. So that's not a good thing. Now, so the question is how to balance the uh, the public policy aspects, if you will, uh, against the industrial policy aspects, if I can use that term. And and to me, one of the one of the primary and this is based on on our experience in the U.S. One of the primary reasons for wanting to get away from concentration is that if you have a concentrated industry uh, and it's a democracy, <laughs> the, the, the principles in that concentrated industry have an awful lot of power to set policy, to influence policy with their governments. I don't mean in any suggestion to suggest in any way that this is corrupt. This is the way democracies work. People are interested in talking to legislators and administrators about what's inter what's in their best interest from the standpoint of policy. Well, if you've got one or two airlines and they're both talking to legislators and administrators about what's best for Indian aviation, you can be sure it probably is not going to encourage the competition that the, the country would probably like to have. So it's just another reason why you you want to open up your industry in a deliberate and, and careful and, and, excuse me, measured way to ensure that you have not just one or two, but uh, a number of of stable, well-managed, well-financed players uh, who might have different views as to, as to what Indian aviation policy should look like, uh, how much of it should be focused on low-cost carriers, how much of it should be to make sure that there are global players who can who can match the offerings of of global mega carriers around the world. That's it's. I've probably said enough about it. I just think that there is a a reason for having uh, a multiplicity of of airlines in a market the size of India that that goes perhaps beyond the traditional competitive considerations. It's it's how policy is made. It's it's just looking at the policy making process realistically and recognizing that if you have just a couple, uh, they are going to have an outsized. Uh, influence on the way policy is set. And that's what's happened uh, in the U.S. in the past. It's what's happened, what happened in India, obviously, in the early 2000s. Um, it's important to go in the direction that India is going. And it's it's exciting to see uh, the, the progress that India has made. Um, it's one of the most exciting aviation markets in the world. If I can if I add one more sort of general point about mega carriers, when we uh, transitioned in the U.S. in the early 1990s to an open skies international aviation policy, uh, we didn't anticipate one of the most important effects of that transition. Once we opened 
the doors to more competition in international markets, we had open entry. At that point, international carriers from abroad and within the U.S. could come together in alliances and seek something that the United States Department of Transportation had the authority to give, which was immunity from the antitrust laws. They couldn't merge because we all have these anachronistic requirements that uh, our airlines, our domestic airlines, be owned and operated and controlled by our citizens. That's true in the U.S. and it's true in most countries around the world. That means that you can't have the cross-border alliances, cross-border mergers that probably you would have if the industry didn't have those rules. So the international the global branded alliances, if you will, emerged as a workaround. But in order to be as close to a merger as possible and still not violate the nationality requirements that all of our governments have imposed, they had to have antitrust immunity so they could get together in a, in a conference room and talk about, well, what are the markets that we should be serving? How can we serve them best? How can we code share in a way that, that really puts our brand out there in the most effective way, in a mutually beneficial way? The open skies created the wherewithal, first of all, for the the old sky team. Um, it was called the Wings Alliance, I think, in, in, in the early 90s. It became sky team. It was originally Northwest and KLM. Well, then you had the Star Alliance, and then you had the One World Alliance, all predicated on open skies agreements with the United States that enabled the U.S. Department of Transportation to grant immunity to those alliances. And so now you have competition globally defined by a collection of supercarriers that end up providing a quality of service, I think, that would have been unthinkable before these alliances uh, came along and were given the scope to to provide the sort of convenience and seamless connections that they do today. I wanted to just go further and how important it is for India to have this institutional framework. And I, I must add before uh, I, I ask for your comments is that India has a very weak institutional in, in infrastructure in terms of its safety, in terms of its security. It's not independent given the size of the industry. And more important, I think the, the consumer, even though we have the consumer laws and uh, in the in the CAR about protecting consumer interest aligned to the best practice in implementation may be a challenge. So whilst these Emma emerge, uh, mega carriers emerge, how important it is to have this institutional in infrastructure in place, uh, protecting the consumer rights, ensuring that it is just not a document, but it is extremely effective and it actually protects consumer interest. It actually it has a competition policy in place which is just not a document, which actually ensures that the competition uh, in place. And how does the industry structure remain viable and relevant? And in terms of industry structure becoming viable and relevant, I may add, what's your views that if there are new entrants coming or the, the smaller players in the current environment, how does, how does the policy making encourage them to ensure that they are relevant, they grow, and they become more competitive in the future? Um, so... Uh, yeah. Great question, Kevin. I I think you cannot possibly overstate the importance of a a solid uh, and and capable institutional framework. And I, before going to consumer rights or consumer protection, I would go to uh, the the very regulation of the air carriers themselves. Uh, when somebody shows up with an application to get a, a permit and start service as an airline. How does it cap does it have the requisite capitalization? Are there rules within India that define what requisite capitalization is? What about managerial fitness? Have the people that are running this airline ever run an airline before? Do they have any idea what the challenges are? Rule obeying. I mean, do they have a record of complying with regulations? Because it's a highly regulated industry from the standpoint of safety and the standpoint of infrastructure. So if if you don't have that, and I'm not commenting on what India has, because frankly, I'm not entirely up to date on, on the current state of the Indian CAA. But if you don't have the wherewithal to ensure that people entering the market can stay in the market, can actually provide that competitive challenge to the incumbents, then all you're doing is you're setting yourself up for, for more of what's happened in the past. You have people that come in, they, they aren't making money, and so they immediately drop fares. 
they destroy the market. You can always charge low fares if you don't care about profitability. But unfortunately, uh, your competitors will be forced to match you if they want to maintain some, some semblance of market share. And the net result is that the entire industry becomes non-competitive and it becomes unstable as a result. That's not a good thing. Um, we're, we're having right now, you can look in the United States, we have uh, ultra low cost carriers. We have one of them, Spirit Air, trying to merge with JetBlue, which is a more conventional, it's a competitive carrier. It's not a mega carrier, but it isn't what we call an ultra low cost carrier. The Justice Department has decided that there is too much concentration in the industry, apparently, that's what they're saying, and therefore they're suing to block the merger of JetBlue and the ultra low cost carrier Spirit. From my perspective, I would have thought that if you're worried about the concentration among mega carriers, you've said that they're, they, they have almost 70% of the market, wouldn't you want the prospect of another one <laughs> to, to challenge those mega carriers in a much more effective way, more effectively than JetBlue can by itself, or certainly that, that Spirit can by itself? And yet we, we have this, this, this concern about whether or not Consumers will have access to the lowest prices in the market today, which might be spirits. The problem is that if you really look what passengers pay to get on a spirit flight, they probably pay a lot more than the spoken fare, but the, the, the fare that's advertised because they're paying separately for bags, they're paying separately for food, they're paying separately for a whole variety of amenities. That's because of the unbundling that has made the business so interesting in the U.S. So I, I think it's important um, to maintain some semblance of what it is that you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a stable market with meaningful competition, even among mega carriers, you can't necessarily just try to preserve the, the lowest cost competitor against all odds. It's not probably going to last very long in any event. To add to this question, uh, Jeffrey, um, how would you advise Indian company, Indian regulator, if you were to advise them that there are new carriers who are very small, there will be new incumbents, and I'm, I'm the view that one or two are in the process of coming and, and becoming operational in about FI26, if or not in FI21. But there's this issue that slots, peak slots are, are challenging, getting an excess at peak slots is an issue, getting, let's say, parking bays at, at key airports, which are very concentrated, is a challenge. And there are multiple other factors. How does the institutional inf infrastructure, if it is to promote competition, how does it ensure whether it is market access issues, whether it has slots issues, extra, extra, extra? How does it, from a policy making structure, uh, you know, uh, guardrail them, ring fence them, so that there is effective competition actually in place? Otherwise, yeah. normally, if you don't have those guardrails, then people will come and start, but they will find themselves challenged in in in, in in the hands of these megaphones. Well, I'm a great believer, and I think uh, U.S. policy is predicated on a, on a very solid belief in, in, the, in the wisdom of the market, if I can use that phrase. Um, so I think it's important, again, to have the institutional framework in place to ensure that people in the business know what they're doing, are doing it responsibly, are doing it in a way that is likely to serve the public, um, but without destroying the market in the process. Uh, but I wouldn't overstate the importance of guardrails. I think what, what's really important for government is to make sure that the market has capacity, that airports can uh, accommodate more flights than they're currently accommodating. Uh, even, even in the United States, because of the limitation in airport capacity that we've been experiencing, as I think Stuti said in her presentation, the Justice Department has required the divestiture of slots in order to approve certain combinations of carriers to ensure that the, bringing two carriers together doesn't totally wipe out the prospect of competition at particular airports that those two carriers may be serving head to head. That's an important thing to do. And uh, similarly, expanding airport capacity just with more investment in airports. I think the privatization of airports in India is a dramatic a dramatic uh, development which uh, holds enormous promise for the for the future of uh, aviation in India. It's very exciting, but much more going on in India, I would say, on that front than in the U.S., certainly. Um, more of that is needed. But it, again, investors will be encouraged to invest in airport capacity if they know that the government is willing 
to allow more entrants to come into the market in a way that will enhance the competition that's available to consumers and enhance the quality of, of, of the services that are provided by everybody. I mean, one of the most important things I think you said, Kapil, in your presentation was uh, toward the end that the addition of new entrants will be good for the mega carriers. I couldn't put it better than that. I mean, it's absolutely right. It keeps them on their toes. It makes sure that they are continuing to serve the public in the, in the best way that they can, uh, continuing to innovate themselves. They will have more capacity to innovate because they have more, they have deeper pockets probably than some of the new, newer guys that come in. You want them to never stop innovating. And, and what they need to do is they need to have a challenge. And if that challenge isn't there in a, in a palpable way, uh, they'll begin to rest on their laurels. That's, that's the history of this business, unfortunately. One can debate about consumer interest and protection of consumer interest. It depends upon who you talk. It would, you will get a different answer. In a growing economy like this in India, how does one policy as a policymaker define consumer interest? And what, how do you make sure that becomes a, a policy by statute or by law? Because I think if you go and assess uh, the market, different Surveys and different research can give you that, yes, consumer interest is protected. But whether they are actually protected or not, how does one make sure that it is very strategic rather than just ad hoc? In, in the U.S., if I can return to that experience, the uh, primary function of the Department of Transportation in the area of consumer protection has been to require maximum disclosure. Uh, air, passengers should know what they're paying all in, uh, for a ticket. Uh, they should know what the conditions are. Uh, all of it with today's technology, there's no reason for any passenger who's buying a ticket not to know everything about the transaction that they're about to enter. So that's been an important uh, and very successful piece of uh, airline consumer regulation in the United States. Um, I think there is a tendency among regulators, however, to try to tweak the market in ways that go well beyond what we would see in, in other sectors. Uh, my personal uh, candidate for the worst regulation ever in history is EU Regulation 261, which requires airlines to fork money over to passengers whenever they're late or if there's a if there's a cancellation. And now, heaven forbid, the Department of Transportation is so intrigued with that that they're trying to replicate it, or at least they've talked about proposing a replication of that of that uh, regulation. Why is it the worst regulation ever? A regulation's purpose is to create an incentive that the market itself does not create. It's to basically respond to what we would call a market failure. In the case of delays and cancellations, and you will know, as somebody who knows about this business, that the, the worst thing that can possibly happen in, in the course of a, a, the, the day in the life of an airline is a delay, especially if it's the kickoff flight, because it will cascade through the rest of the system and cause delays everywhere and cause the staff enormous headaches, uh, probably cost a lot of money in terms of people that will have to be put up as a result of canceled flights. There is no larger incentive that the market provides than the incentive to be on time and not to cancel flights. So what does EU 261 add to that incentive? Precisely nothing. Nothing that's not already there. It merely piles on and requires that in addition, in addition to the cost of the delay itself uh, and all the inconvenience, that there now be cash handed over to consumers as a consolation prize. That, that to me, I understand that passengers love getting those checks after they've been inconvenienced. It's a nice, it's a nice little reward for all the inconvenience you suffered, but it doesn't do a thing that the that the regulation is designed to do. It has not increased or decreased. Uh, the incentive, it, ha it hasn't increased the incentive, it hasn't just decreased the number of cancellations. It can't. Those are system systemic problems that have to be addressed otherwise. I wanted to ask you that if, how important is for India to have this similar to an antitrust expertise and infrastructure as we grow to the next level of our development? Because we don't have anything of that quality right now. What would you basically, let's say, not advise the government or just how important it is to have that antitrust infrastructure in place, whether it is related to merger and acquisition, whether it is related to code share alliances, how important is that that institutional infrastructure is housed within the policy making? 
in, in the very, US, it's yeah. Department of Transport. Here is Ministry of Civil Aviation. How important is to have an infrastructure? It's extremely important. Uh, I, I think if, if, if you're in a capitalistic economy, uh, there is the potential for monopolization. There is the potential for market abuse. There's no question about that. And and uh, we've known for a long time, and a lot of countries know that it is important to maintain competition sometimes through uh, through the courts or through judicial methods. Um, one, one little point of uh, detail that I, I might just mention is that in the in the 1980s, when there was a raft of mergers uh, in the United States, under the, 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 the Airline Deregulation Act and the CAB Sunset Act, the wistfully entitled CAB Sunset Act that put the, uh, the, the Civil Aeronautics Board out of business finally, uh, the Department of Transportation had for a number of years the antitrust authority over domestic aviation. So those mergers that took place in the 1980s were actually approved by the Department of Transportation, not by the Department of Justice. And I will say that I think history records that uh, many of them were approved over the objections of the Department of Justice, but DOT had the authority under the law until, I believe, the end of 1989 or the beginning of 1989. It would transition back to the Department of Justice, which has it now. And so domestic mergers are all, are all reviewed by the Department of Justice. Having said that, you will be aware that um, Democratic administrations have one approach to the antitrust laws and Republican administration seems to have another. Uh, we see kind of a an ebbing and flowing of, of the the ferocity or the aggressiveness of antitrust enforcement depending upon the political party uh, that is in office. Now, I don't think that either party feels less strongly about competition than the other. I mean, when when I when I showed up as a uh, an assistant secretary at the Department of Transportation in 1989, after that raft of mergers that I talked about, there was genuine concern. Now, this was a Republican administration. Genuine concern about all of those mergers that had taken place and whether or not, as a result of those mergers, the, the industry had simply become much too concentrated, that the promise of deregulation had had basically expired and that right now we were going to go back into uh, a much more concentrated uh, and oligopolistic industry. So my boss, uh, the Secretary of Transportation, a man named Samuel Skinner, took that very seriously. Um, the The entire administration took it seriously, and he, he determined that he was going to study the market. Uh, he required a, a year-long study, which ended up filling nine different volumes, I think. I, I was in charge of the staff that put the study together. Um, and at the end of the at the end of the day, based on empirical analysis, and all of the analysis was peer reviewed. I mean, this was no this was no whitewash. We concluded, notwithstanding all the all the concern about the concentration in the industry, that in fact, individual consumers had more choice available to them now than they had in the past. And that's because yes, there were fewer airlines overall. But they were competing with each other in, great, in a great many more markets so that anybody looking to buy a ticket between two cities in the U.S. would have more choice on average uh, as a result of uh, deregulation than they would have had prior to deregulation, notwithstanding the consolidation that had taken place. So it, uh, my, my lesson from that, and by the way, I testified before Congress on alleged concentration in the industry many, many times as a result uh, of that concern. I relied on the analysis and the study at each of those hearings, and I felt that nobody ever laid a glove on me because we, frankly, we felt that the analysis was correct, and Congress never, never touched a hair on the head of the Airline Deregulation Act as a result. So I, I, I believe it's very important when you're looking at concentration, when you're looking at consumer concerns, do a thoroughgoing analysis. Do not base decisions on assumptions uh, or um, uh, the conventional wisdom. The analysis is very often different. Uh, last question. Would mega carriers be interested in servicing tier two cities in India or would we left to Indian carriers to do a, a hub and spoke to tier two cities? Well, they, they should be. Uh, this this actually is a great question. Uh, it, it reminds me of something else that I wanted to mention uh, about open skies. The transition to open skies policy in the United States 
as you would expect, wasn't that easy. I mean, the U.S. airlines weren't that interested in opening the doors to maximum competition from their foreign competitors. Uh, the reason we were able to do it politically was because of the interest of cities in having those direct connections to foreign foreign lands. Um, they bring in tourism, they bring in investment, they begin factories, they all sorts of things happen when you have direct international service, nonstop service from foreign capitals to your community. And so um, right now, I think you have, you know, five major international gateways in India, if I'm not mistaken, maybe three of them are they're really major. Um, there are undoubtedly a lot of very large cities in India that would benefit enormously from international air service. And this goes back to my first point about what is the purpose of aviation policy. If the purpose of aviation policy is to grow the economy, then the government should be looking at the possibility of more open skies agreements than it currently has. It will not damage the domestic aviation market. We have proven time and time again in the United States, despite all of the fears, that liberal markets grow much, much faster than regulated markets. Open skies markets go grow much faster than traditional markets. You've talked about, I think, growing the current international share from 41% beyond that. I don't think the goal should be to have a higher percentage. 41% of a bigger pie would be just as good. And that might very well be the, the solution uh, for, for secondary cities. Uh, so forgive me for <laughs> uh, going on, but um, I, I genuinely think that uh, the more service you can bring into the country to more cities, more communities, uh, the better off the country will be and the better off India's aviation sector will be as a result. This is the last question. I think it's from my office, but uh, uh, it, it seems to be an anonymous attendee for now. Uh, how can an institutional weakness be addressed with lack of local talent resource considering the forthcoming hyper growth of Indian market? And I again come to this level of expertise that is required uh, to ensure that we make a transition uh, to, to a very strong and big, big aviation industry. It's a very tough question, and many, many, many countries have, uh, have had to face it. I think at the end of the day, uh, sorry to say it, but you get what you pay for. And so uh, it may be necessary for the government to take a look at what it is compensating uh, people in the, in the government, in the CAA, People are on the line doing the inspections, doing the kind of uh, air traffic control, things that, that the, the sector absolutely needs. Um, you're going to have to have a big talent pool there in order to accommodate the growth that we've been talking about. And without that, uh, none of it will happen. So it's a very important part of the challenge, and it's an excellent question. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much for joining us. Delighted to have you here. And, uh, and and I'm sure that my team uh, and, and the participants in the larger industry would have benefited. I hope to stay in touch. 